Come on, if you're blessed, give God a hand. Praise one more time for all the blessed folks in the building. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Again, what a what a great blessing it is to be a part of such a great church. We know that uh, you know our church is a unique and special place, and uh, I'm so excited and glad that we have uh, great great voices and people who can proclaim the word of God with great power and great. Uh, clarity and, and whatnot. And, and so I, I was hoping that we would be able to have a, a, a really wonderful opportunity to do both a Pentecost sermon and a graduation sermon. But through uh, the course of, of just some of my discerning this week, I was thinking, you know, it'd be great just to allow, you know, one of our, our most powerful voices here at The Way to, to be the voice of, of the gospel as we uh, celebrate both our Pentecost and our graduation. The scripture says in Acts chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost, they all were gathered together with one voice, and they all heard the good news of the Lord in a language they could understand. There were a diverse kind of of, of expressions, of clarity, of clarifying the good news of the Lord, and people from different people groups from all across the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, happened to be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and they heard the word of God literally in their own language as the Spirit moved them. And, and I thought it would just be a wonderful opportunity for us to allow the Spirit to speak to us through the voice and the, and the experience and the prophetic power of uh, our newly minted, uh, but always anointed Dr. Tiffany Marie, amen. And she is, uh, has been a great, great gift. Um, I've known and we've known uh, uh, Tiffany uh, for uh, at least uh, 15 years or so. Uh, her, she has been a, a major uh, force of, of good in our communities. Um, I met her uh, when I first came to Berkeley, uh, well, returned here from uh, seminary and was getting ready to launch the church. And she was one of the powerhouse students, along with my wife and Tonisha and Alicia and Talib and, and, and who, who, who else we had? They had a whole crew of UC Berkeley uh, black folk, amen, who, who was just reminding UC Berkeley, amen, that, you know, even before folks were saying Black Lives Matter, it was up there reminding folks that black folks and black liberation and, and Jesus and faith and, and all these things were and are an important uh, reality. She's a hip hop artist, amen, and she is an educator. Uh, she, she, in her one of her former lives, amen, uh, she served as a youth director I, I called her a youth pastor, but she didn't like that, at uh, uh, one of the Baptist churches here in the, in the city and, and was preaching back then. And, and then she moved her preaching into classrooms and places outside the four walls of the church. And, and so um, in, in, in the only fashion, if you know Tiffany, you know that uh, she is a very eclectic, gifted sister and when you ask her to do things you know uh she does it with great joy amen <laughs> and and so i am so excited that she agreed to bring the word of god today um because i do believe that on a day like today where we we acknowledge graduates and we're also uh, uh leaning into how the spirit is moving in this season. How many of you can feel the spirit moving in ways in the church where some of us who've been in church were like, wow, this is a little different. And half y'all ain't raising your hands, so I just assume y'all ain't never been in church. And that's okay, because we like that too. That's part of how the spirit is moving, right? When the scripture says God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh, how many know not everybody's in church, right? And so all flesh means folks outside the church too. That that our reach as a church is not just Sunday only, but it is Everywhere, everywhere where God's people are, where creation is, God is pouring out God's spirit. And so I'm super excited for you uh, to hear the ministry of this great, great uh, loved one. Uh, many of us have experienced her uh, blessing us uh, through uh, either her uh, hope dealer work. How many have a hope dealer shirt? Amen. That's that's part of part of the spirit you wearing you wearing her her product all over the country. Amen. I'm a hope dealer mannequin, a hope dealer model. 
Amen. And, and, and I appreciate that. Amen. Um, and, and she, she also uh, has been teaching at the leadership public high schools. Uh, before that she was at St. Paul, the shipwreck or no, it was a, it was a KIPP school that was at St. Paul, the shipwreck. And, uh, she, as we, we just heard, she just finished her PhD at UC Berkeley and, uh, just a great, great loved one. Uh, her new band is called Arletta. No, Ar uh, that's so sad because they performed on Easter Sunday, and I, 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 I'm, I'm, I just can't remember much. But I remember her name, so we're going to ask you to stand up, everybody, and let's put our hands together, and let's welcome Dr. Tiffany Marie, as she is the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to be real quick so y'all can enjoy the weather and other people. Uh, please bow your heads with me very briefly. God, we thank you for this day, this time. Um, I am uh, so grateful to be able to be here and to attempt to profess your word to your people. I pray that you would remove me and you would stand uh, before me, that your power, uh, your message would reach your people. In the name of the Most High, I pray, amen. That was a really long introduction. Um, and just for people who are thinking about getting their PhD, we met 15 years ago, but it didn't take me 15 years <laughs> to complete that. I was also doing my undergrad at Cal as well, just in case some of y'all were figuring out those numbers in your head. Uh, we're gonna come from, we're gonna come from Luke 21. And it says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. And these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all of this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and on all account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win in life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city for this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers, that there will be distress in the land and wrath against the people. Sorry. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror. 
apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is a message I'm bringing as we celebrate commencements and graduations. <laughs> and um, this is the first time I've preached at this church, I believe, in this fashion. <laughs> Not the first time asked, he said. Uh, and and I always get really, really nervous before um, these types of talks, particularly as they relate to commencements, because I really feel like I bring a certain level of integrity, and I don't know if that's what everybody wants to hear. I have had commencement speeches where I have been asked to change my speech both beforehand and during. <laughs> so these spaces are nerve wracking and I'm very fearful of them uh, because I wonder and challenge what it means to bring what seems to be the word of God when there's already a certain level of hegemony, there's already a belief of what a commencement speech should sound like. So before I get into it, I'll just say congrats. <laughs> yep. So that it was said at least once today. Congrats. And, and as I get into the talk, and I, again, I'll be quick. It, I want to, to center, um, just for context, the work uh, of Howard Thurman. And, and he says that when we think about this context, he says that mere preaching is not enough. And he questions, what are words? However sacred and powerful in the presence of the grim facts of the daily struggle to survive. Any attempt to deal with this situation on the basis of values that disregard the struggle for survival appears to be in itself a compromise with life. It is only when people live in an environment in which they are not required to exert ex a supreme effort into just keeping alive, that they seem to be able to select ends besides those of mere physical survival. On a subsistence level, values are interpreted in terms of their bearing upon one major concern for all activity, not being killed. Not to be killed becomes the great end and morality takes its meaning from that center until that center is shifted. Even in the robes, even with a piece of paper that will be mailed to you, until that center is shifted, nothing real can be accomplished. If I spent that many years working to get this piece of paper and this validation and this weird woman stood before me and said, none of that was significant. I would be either disregard her words or I'd be, especially as folks who might be in those programs right now, in an extreme state of panic and worry and fear. And I would want to know what it takes to shift that center. Yeah. And so I thought of, and I preached this uh, years ago, probably when I was about 14 years old, and the people in the crowd, they just looked at me the entire time. Nobody said anything back to me. Hopefully y'all be different today. I'm gonna preach something I preached when I was 14 year old, uh, years old. I wanna talk about the panic room, the panic room. So, so years ago, uh, Jodie Foster uh, was in a, a film called The Panic Room. Yeah. And in it, she and her daughter, she's a single mother and her daughter, they move into this brand new place. And uh, they notice, it's a brownstone, state of the art, and they notice what comes with the place is its own top of the line panic room. Yeah. yeah. And for some of y'all are like, what, what is that? What is a panic room? Because in my house, there was no extra house or room rather. Uh, every room was occupied, every space was occupied, so I'm, I know that may be, for some of us, a little bit confusing about what in the world is a panic room. Panic room goes back to many, uh, medieval days. Uh, that was a room that was secured simply for attack, to protect one from siege. 
And currently, a lot of homes of the wealthy and the elite have panic rooms where their resource and that which is very valuable to them is in that room just in case someone comes in to attack them. It will lock and they're able to stay in there until help arrives. Y'all with me so far? Amen. So she moves into this house that has its own panic room. And the first night that they are in the house, this is Hollywood, there's a break in. And so they run into the panic room, the doors close, and that is where essentially uh, the story begins. Yeah. And I want us to think about that idea of the panic room as it relates to shifting, not just the panic room, but panic, as it relates to shifting uh, that center. Pastor Mike this morning asked me for the title of this piece. I don't have one. I've gone through about six or seven in the past week. Um, so I don't know. Maybe y'all can help me come up with one at the end. Yep. But as we think about that center being shifted, the first thing that I, 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 I want us to think about um, is the actual panic room and what it means to be able to have access to a panic room. The, the idea of, of any space that secures one's well-being is in and of itself an act, a representation, or a sign of privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I know when we talk about privilege, some people, especially as it relates to our degrees, would like to think that you worked for it and that the privilege that comes with you being elevated, you deserve. Be yes, I, I know, I told y'all I didn't want to do this. If y'all can see the faces that I see. <laughs> and there's some truth to that to some extent. And even those who, who uh, you know, to, to Jody Foster's point, who are born into the privilege, they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? She's like, it was in the house when I got here. I don't have control over how much my parents made. I don't, I don't have control over the type of privilege that I was born into. So I understand the resistance to, to, to even associating or aligning oneself with privilege. Yeah. But, but what we have to understand about privilege is it gives us the ability, those of us who have access to it, to draw lines and to draw boundaries and to establish spaces and places where we might be protected and by nature of the hierarchies and the stratification that are, exist in our society, if we have privilege to draw lines where we will be protected, we naturally also have privilege to draw lines as to where others will not be protected. And so in part of shifting uh, that, that center, we have to be conscious of the ways in which our privilege can draw lines between scarcity and abundance. Yeah. Check, check this out. There's, there's an issue with us blindly, and part of why I didn't want to come on the stage, there's an issue with us blindly taking on the accolades and the privilege that comes with those accolades, right? Take this, for instance. So, in this structure, the one that Thurman talks about, if we take on the privilege that means securing our well-being, we might subconsciously be ensuring the social death of others, of norming that if our hard work contributed to our security, think about the language of what that means of those who we feel like did not work as hard as us and what we subconsciously are saying that they should be subjected to. Watch this. Years ago, uh, I'm watching the news, and uh, a colleague or a peer of mine, actually, who, who went to Cal, she went to a prestigious private school. And she's from Bayview Hunters Point. And so we were so proud of her, and we celebrated her getting across town, because that's how San Francisco is stratified. You can still be in the same city. Yeah. And we house the pain in certain parts of the city. And we house abundance in other parts. And so she had made it over to the abundant side of San Francisco. 
out of Bayview Hunters Point for high school. She got a scholarship. And we were so proud of her. And, and one night, at, at, I believe it was her senior year, I'm watching the news, and I didn't even know this was her. One night, her father was uh, killed in the parking lot at her game. And I, as I was watching Fox News, they began to interview people. And some expressed their pain and frustration. And I remember the commentary from one woman. And she didn't say anything about my friend and the loss of her father. But what she did say is this is scary because this is not supposed to happen here. And it hit me that we have created a society and we have normed the type of thinking where it is supposed to happen. Where the perpetuation of social death is justified with the ongoing harassment and criminalization of bodies, it makes sense in those places. We have created a structure where year after year after year, at certain schools, children fail. And we will pull the one or two kids on stage who have graduated and who are going on and we will cheer. And there are certain schools where if that much failure hit that school in one year, the entire structure would change. We have to be careful with how we blindly associate ourselves to that privilege that comes with the academy and the accolades of the academy. And so in the text, we have this widow. And what becomes really interesting to me, I don't know if we have the first, give me the next slide. What we have about this widow is we know her as widow. That so much so that we have normed that her social ex uh, existence becomes associated with loss. And this is the person who in this text is being asked to give all she has. There are those around her who give fractions of their wealth and their privilege. And I remember being in church <laughs> at this Baptist church that Pastor Mike talked about. And right before offering, this is the passage that we would bring up. And it wasn't, and this was a church that had some of the, the city's most leading uh, real estate agents selling house after house after house, some on Oprah. We didn't talk to them during offering. But I remember this message coming to the poor, to be more like the widow. Isn't that beautiful that she gave everything she had? And I remember as a teenager, I want to be like her. I want to be celebrated for being broke. Right? I know that I don't have access to wealth, but maybe I could be celebrated for giving up every, and that's what they say, she, get, she gave what she had. And no one in there pointed out how problematic and uneven the expectation was that she would give all <laughs> she had. Yeah. It says to live on. Yeah. Goodness gracious. Yeah. We have to understand that our ask of the marginalized is uneven. Even when we think about it, some people may not know this, in, in our communities there's something called a poverty tax. Do you know that the gas in poor communities is higher than the, the gas in... Do you know that even on the meters, one time I went to the Sunset District of San Francisco, in Bayview they would ask for a quarter, you get about five minutes to park. I went to the Sunset District and for about a dime you got half an hour, so what in the world? The cost of the marginalized is uneven in this society. Now, if we think about the ask of this widow, I even question, for what? 
She gives everything she has to live on and all she gets is the label of widow. She doesn't have a name. Let's think about biblically the significance of names. Names tell us one's purpose. Names tell us and solidify that that person has been called by God to go out and do profound things. She doesn't have a name. We have to be cautious, those of us privileged people. I want to think about the text real quick. About 1% of the dialogue in the Bible come from women. 1%. It's about 86 women. And only half of them have been named. And what we get in this passage is this woman is good enough, her coins, her labor is good enough to uphold the structure, but her voice is not significant to speak out against it. And so the room, the panic room, <laughs> is a sign of privilege. One's ability to use people's labor, to use people's offerings, and not even say their name is an act of privilege. Yeah. The ability to see one as valuable of only what they can do for you, and you are not questioned or challenged, yeah. is privilege. privilege. Yeah. And we, and some of y'all are like, wait a minute, I'm oppressed too. You can't be talking to me. This message is not applicable. Some of y'all have already written me off. It got uncomfortable. Oh, she ain't talking to me. I grew up poor. You know, years ago, Angela Davis talks with Ice Cube in an interview. And, and they talk about the black struggle. You can't find, mind you, you can't find this interview anywhere. Yeah. And the entire time, we can only imagine what happened to it. And the entire time, Ice Cube is talking about, uh, we, we, we got to come up. We got to come up. And Angela Davis says, I hear that, but in all of your examples, you are talking about black men. And, he, and, and she says, when I talk about we, as a black feminist, I have been able to use examples of how black men are being marginalized and how black men are being oppressed, and I mean we. She says, I would love, and this is an elder, the love of an elder, I would love for you to talk about black women. I know you are oppressed. I know you've been criminalized, but I would like you to just say black women. And he wasn't able to do that in that interview. Yeah. And so I want us to be careful of dismissing ourselves because we too have been oppressed. Yeah? Let's be cautious of that. I want us to be careful of not blindly using the privilege that comes with, uh, with our accolades from the academy or universities and aligning ourselves with the people who actually sustain the suffering and social death of others. You know, and, and, and some of y'all are, are, are like, uh, um, you know, wait a minute, because Jodie Foster's character was a victim. I know, but check this out. As the movie unfolds, I realize that the people who broke into the house were actually the folks who previously lived there. And so I saw her, and initially I saw a victim. And then I realized they are simply coming back for what was rightfully theirs. They had left millions of dollars in the safe room. And they were coming into the house to take it back. Yep. My next point is that we cannot 
shift the center when our panic prevents clarity. So watch this. Some folks, when you are being called out and when you are being challenged, it might seem like they are coming for you. For some of us, when we are being called out of our privilege, it may be as scary as someone coming in to break into our house. But I want to question, what if that fear was a lack of clarity on the situation? What if your humanity was really bound up in their dehumanization? Would that be scary? if what it meant for everything that you understand about your social positioning to be challenged. And here's the thing, it is scary when one asks you to check <laughs> yourself. That can be a really frightening time and we have, we have, through privilege, the opportunity to not engage that conversation. Through privilege we have the opportunity to dismiss. Right? But what if we're being asked to think about whether or not our panic prevents clarity? To men, to straight men, women desiring and claiming their humanity might seem like a very frightening thing. Women asking you to be conscious of your misogyny and your patriarchy it may seem like they are coming for your entire being. I want you to think about how much resistance there was to this simple phrase, black lives matter. The nation, I mean the nation was uneasy. And some of us might question, why might something so simplistic be so scary and cause so much panic? Well, if your own stability and your own humanity has literally come from standing on the backs of other people, don't you understand that when they choose to actually stand up, you're gonna fall? Yeah. If you think about, and we talk about even the structure of this society and we think about capitalism, I like to teach it like I talk about a cheerleading pyramid. Have y'all seen those before? Yes, so essentially we never really saw 12 cheerleaders standing up. Did you, in a pyramid? No, we saw a bunch standing on top of others and really maybe one or two at the top, yes? And what it would mean in that system, in that structure, that structure, for it to be sustained was a whole bunch of people to be stepped on. Now depending on the privilege that you embody, it might seem really violent if all of them just decided while they were on their knees what, to just stand up together. You could either focus on the one falling and busting her head, or you can celebrate the massive number of people who actually stood up. Yeah. And it is our education, <laughs> it is our schooling rather, that determines what we choose to focus on. Yeah. So, Some of us may be able to see it as an invitation toward actually accessing our humanity. But there is a thin line between what it feels like to be indicted and what it feels like to be invited. Yeah. And some of us need both. But I believe that we and many of us who were on this stage, who will continue to be on these stages, are not only being indicted 
in our collusion, in our blind alignment with certain privileges that sustain social death, I think so many of us are also being invited into new ways of thinking about what we are called to do with that privilege. Yeah. And I'm gonna get out of here. My last point. I said I was gonna be quick. My last point, give me that, is shifting the center may involve undoing the structure. Yeah. There's this little boy, I don't know if y'all saw the video, uh, little tiny boy, and they put a microphone in his hand, and he says, he gets up in front of the entire church, and he says, y'all know what he said? I'm tired of this church. And I think if that woman might not have been there to grab that mic, he would have dropped the mic. Yeah. And I heard, and I heard the, mm, did you hear it in the background? Of all the elders and the, and the mothers who, mm, you know. And I, I, I want to write a paper about that little boy. Because we laugh, but I think there's so much critical scholarship in what he chose to do that day. I don't know the context. It seemed like some of the trauma that I had as a child where you are told what you were gonna get up there and say. It's not a consensual process. And weeks upon weeks upon weeks, you have to memorize it, you have to recite it at home, and you're scared and you better not get up there, right? Because that makes you more comfortable, right? The threat prepares you more. And he gets up there and there was something, of, I don't know what happened. I don't know what spirit fell on him. But I think he looked out on that crowd and I, and I, I think, and he was little, but there was something about his spirit that seemed like he was just, he was tired. He was tired of the ongoing youth meetings with two people there, you know what I'm saying? He was tired of the youth ministry choir rehearsals where it was all adults in the choir. I think he was tired of the structure. And the Bible says, suffer the little children. Right? Mm -hmm. Let them speak. And I think they were expecting him to come up there and say what many folks have expected me to say when I've been invited to speak, <laughs> particularly as it relates to commencements. And I come to say, I'm tired of this structure. I'm tired of our sustaining of the type, and I don't just mean the church. I'm tired of the type of structures that sustain the well-being of very few. And so many of us align ourselves with it, even though when we look in our communities, we know that we are outliers. We know that there will continue to be one or two. We know that it was not designed for us. And we also continue to support and sustain because sometimes it seems like the only hope that we have. Some folks have suggested that my messaging to disrupt this way of thinking, these ideologies, and to actually work towards something else seem, in their words, very apocalyptic. Wow. <laughs> and as I have said, uh, before this year, you know, that statement initially was very scary to me. Yeah. And if we look at the, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. I was bothered by that initially, that maybe I wasn't hopeful enough. How do you have a hope dealer brand and people feel as if your work is apocalyptic? <laughs> But 
then, after talking with uh, some black women, they said, what is wrong with an apocalypse? And they raised that an apocalypse is only scary. An apocalypse is only frightening. An apocalypse only puts us in a state of panic, really, in white movies and white literature. And that black and black queer science fiction has always celebrated the apocalypse. And that the apocalypse is only, uh, or the society rather, that they sustain is only exciting, and apocalypse is only scary to those who have benefited from that horrific society. <laughs> that an apocalypse shifts the order. An apocalypse yeah. is an investment in a crumbling society. Yeah. And when that society has been responsible for your death, when that society has been responsible for your demise, then maybe it's time to actually celebrate the idea of an apocalypse. And so I want to honor the little boy and his investment in that apocalypse. I want to honor so many of y'all who will choose to use your privilege to shift that center. I want to honor those who come on the stage and who will step off of stages, who will uh, center the voices of those who have been left out. I want to honor those who will use today to celebrate, to support, and to sustain the idea of an oppressive, crumbling society. God bless y'all.